Hey guys, so I'm hoping this microphone uh, increases the volume and the recording and, and helps with your, your viewing entertainment and uh, viewing pleasure and ease. If not, I'll dump it in a minute. But <laughs> anyway, I just thought we'd try it here with the tripod and the speaker in the room and everything. Um, the first two videos we talked about, he teaches us to profit. Probably our two flagship verses is 1 John 2.27. You have the anointing which teaches you concerning all things. You ever thought about what all things is? Teaches you concerning all things. Uh, just a quick side note here. If you go to, um, well, I tell you what, let's just, hey there, Brother Robert. Love you, buddy. Uh, I saw you hooping online the pictures of the other day. That's pretty cool. I had having flashbacks and memories. Um, good old days. Romans chapter 8 verse 31 says, um, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So first John two twenty seven says the anointing teaches us concerning all things. Uh, well, the Bible says he freely gave us all things. Don't you think the anointing is capable of teaching you about all the things that he gave you and how to get them. Um, go to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, and you'll see the, a very similar type deal, for verse, chapter 3, verse 21. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All are yours. You're Christ and Christ is God's. Um, go to 2 Peter 1 and 3. I'll give you these three witnesses. 2 Peter uh, chapter 1 and verse 3 says this, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things. That per is you seeing a pattern here? That pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. Um, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Partaking of the divine nature, what would that be like? Well, it's certainly not to live in uh, squalor, because Christ is seated on a gold throne up in heaven, walking on transparent gold streets, uh, next door to a city whose gates are made of pearls. You know, if you're going to take a partake of the divine nature, you're going to partake of all of it. You know, it's just not one or the other. So the, the anointing, 1 John 2, 27, teaches us concerning all things. Romans 8, 32 says he's given to us all things. Why wouldn't he since he gave us his best thing, which is Jesus? And then you go to 1 Corinthians 2, and he says all things are yours. And he names people, places, things. And then in verse uh, chapter 2 of 1 Peter Chapter 1, verse 3, he says he's given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. And it's through the knowledge or getting to know Jesus is how you get everything he gave you to, that would help you fulfill the godly life he's called you to live. So is it godly to pay your bills? I think so. Is it godly to have a nice home to live in? I think so. That's a good witness. That's a good testimony. What about how, what you drive? Um, what about what you wear? What about what you eat? You know, the world is walking by sight. They're not walking by faith. And so God's going to condescend to their level to reach them with love. And that's why he put stars in the sky, signs and wonders in the heavens above and the earth beneath. What if, what if you started to read the Bible and it was like, you know, one of the signs on the earth below that he wants to show is that I'm a child of the king by the way I dress, by the way I talk, the way I wear, what I, where I live. The job I have, the money I give, the money I spend. I'm a, I'm one of those Joel 2.28 and, and Acts chapter uh, 2 signs in the heavens above and I'm in the earth beneath. Or what about he wants to put you on TV and circle you circle your word, on, your message on around the globe using a satellite. Wouldn't that be a sign in the heavens above? I mean, you know, we just make the Bible so abstract and so far out there that it just does nobody any good on earth and that's not God's intention and so what if I want to write a book and it travels circum 
you know, it vents the, gold, the globe. Well, yeah, there's a sign in the earth below that God is God and God loves you and God wants to teach you to prosper. And so some of, you, of us are going to be asked to come out of our comfort zones. We're going to be asked to be stretched and to do things that maybe we're not accustomed to doing, but it's because he's teaching us to profit. Um, and then, in, and so we read some of those verses and then Isaiah 48, 17 he is the Lord that teaches us to profit. So when you put 1 John 2, 27, Isaiah 48, 17, Romans 8, 32, 2 Peter 1 and 3, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verses 21 through 23. And he wants to teach you how to obtain, how to profit, how to increase in every area of a godly life that he's called you to live. Psalm 139 says he wrote all your days down in a book before you were even born here on the earth. These days are days to prosper, to give you hope in a future to not cut you off. Filled with adventure and livelihood and, and excitement and joy and goodness and truth and mercy and compassion and healing and salvation and fullness and overflow and light and health and victory and dominance and authority and power and influence. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're starting to get it. Now you're starting to trek with me here. And so in the second video, we talked about one of the ways that he will teach you how to profit or how to prosper is to get you out of worry, to get you out of fear and to get you from being the devil's lunch meat, baloney, <laughs> into being a dominant, carefree, not careless, but carefree, submitted, humble Christian. And so if you didn't hear that, go back and watch part two. Part three, we're going to talk about teaching you to profit by seeking first the kingdom. All right. One of the, if he's going to teach you to profit, he's going to teach you to do it in the way that brings no sorrow. And so um, let's just get there. Matthew 633. And actually, we're going back up to Matthew 625 and we'll read through verse 34. Therefore, I say unto you. Take no thought. And this is Matthew 6, uh, 25 through verses 34. I say, this is Jesus talking. Take no thought for your life. Take no thought. So right away, right away, we're just piggybacking on this part two we just did on worry and care and anxiety. You're going to have to roll that over on him instead of taking thought for it. He says, what shall you eat? What shall you drink? Nor yet for your body, what shall you put on? Don't you think that God thought about all of that in your life long before you were born? And he has such a plan for you. Like yesterday, I got a phone call. What are your plans for dinner? My plan is to have no plan. <laughs> they said, well, I don't want to interrupt your plan. I said, no, please. That was part of the plan is... A Holy Ghost intervention. And man, I had the goodest tasting chicken last night that I've had in a long time. And the whole night, whole evening was a blessing. But had I made a plan, I really feel like I probably would have missed out on that blessing. But I just was putting this into practice, taking no thought. Now, does that mean you never pre-think what you're going to cook? No, then you can get in a ditch on it. But the overarching thought is, is quit being so preoccupied with every little detail of your life. God knows what you need. You see, there's a fine line between being diligent and being worrisome. There's a, such a fine line. And that's why you need to keep these kinds of verses in front of your eyes so they can talk to you and say, hey, you think you're being diligent, but you're actually doing this out of fear and worry. And uh, I want to talk to you about something else besides the chicken casserole. All right. So he says, um, is not your life more than meat and the body than raiment. It is not your body's life more than what you think it is. What could he possibly be saying there? Well, he's saying, I've got a life for you to live in your physical body that'll blow your mind if you'll allow me to get it over to you. And see, this goes back to our 1 John 2, 27 and Isaiah 40, 17 verses. He's endeavoring to teach us to profit. 
So evidently, some of us are missing out on profit and increase because we're living our lives in the body, uh, trying to make all the decisions. And, and, and we call him Savior, but he ain't Lord. He may want to send you to Paul's Diner tonight to go get a salad or a Reuben sandwich or a buffalo burger or whatever, but you're going to stay at home and eat casserole or something. And I mean, I, I've, I've had him say, you know, go spend $20 on this and be happy about it because I want to treat you right. I want to treat you nice. I want to, I want to put a good taste in your mouth and I'll pay for it. And you got 20 in your pocket, go do it. But uh, no, I'm going to go stay home and eat Vienna sausage. See, that's a poverty mentality. That's a lack mentality. And see, you play like you practice. And if you practice poverty, well, don't, don't like, well, oh gosh, how come we never prosper? Because you practice poverty. You know, I've said this before, but you know, he goes grocery shopping with you. And if you're faithful in a few things, he'll be make you rule over many. But if you can't be faithful with buying the kind of pickles you like, then how's he going to trust you to pick out carpet in a new house? You're going to get shag carpet or some kind of golf, that fake green grass carpet. And he's like, no, we ain't putting that down. So you go to the grocery store and you know you like Clawson dill pickles. And they're like $4. But you know that the cheapest pickles that taste like they put them in formaldehyde are like a buck 25. And they last longer. So you're going to try to pinch pennies on your pickles. And the Lord is watching that. And he's saying, son, don't you realize you're practicing poverty? Get the pickles you like. I put that desire in you to like righteous pickles and buy the pickles and practice prosperity. And see, if you can't have faith for pickles, well, no wonder you ain't got faith for nothing else. But you practice poverty. Go buy the pickles. <laughs> you know, it's silly, but, but it's not silly. It's the absolute truth. All right. It's the absolute truth. It's the little things that are determining the big things. And we just act like some asteroid is going to land and all of a sudden, sudden change. No, it's the littlest choices that you're making or not. And you, you've just got to understand and reason through with the word of God. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I thinking like I'm thinking? How could I say that this is the word when it actually doesn't look like it at all? And, and is anybody forcing me to stay the same? Or can I actually make a change? Um, you know, I was out of town recently and I was led uh, by the Holy Ghost to go into this mall. And, and not just any door, but go in the J.C. Penney door. I'm not necessarily a J.C. Penney shopper. There's nothing wrong with it. The man was a Christian. He lived on 90% or he, he lived on 10% of his income, gave 90% of away. You know, praise the Lord, James Cash Penny. But I've just, that's not necessarily where I'd go. And, but the Holy Ghost is like teaching me to prosper, teaching me to profit. And so I go in there, and man, I'm telling you what, $60 shirts were for $5 and $10. And it wasn't like they're clearing out the summer stuff for the winter stuff, because it's not time for that yet. This was nice summer stuff. In fact, I'm wearing one of them. $10 bucks for the shirt. I think it was like uh, $40, $50, something like that, normally. Unreal. I mean, the store full of them. I don't know if it's all J.C. Penney's or just that one where I was. But I was like, hook a brother up. I didn't want to go in there, but I had a nudge. I knew the Holy Ghost was like, lead me into something. And, and it's an adventure. What are we going to find in there? My thought was, well, maybe go witness to somebody. And I get in there, and I'm like, man, a blind man can see. There's a sale going on in here. And I'm like, $5, $10 for a nice polo shirt. Bro, I'm in. Let's go. Where, where, What color we want? <laughs> And that's frugal, and that's and it's brand new. It's great stuff. It's nice stuff. I say I gotta have shirts anyway. I shop at the same malls as everybody else. Might as well be frugal, you know. But there's nothing wrong if I'd have went in there with thirty dollars and laid it down and bought it regular price. If that's what I want to do, if that's what he told me to do, and I'm not, you know, stealing from people to do it. Hallelujah. But I'm just telling you, it's it's the littlest decisions that you're not really even maybe paying attention to that are determining whether you're worrisome or not. And you think you think he doesn't watch this stuff, but he does. He cannot trust people who are worriers. You will not prosper. You will not rise and be promoted if you're a worrier. If you're just going to take care of it all for yourself, you're going to do it all for yourself. He cannot trust you. 
He wishes he could, but he can't. And so you'll never be responsible for people. You'll never be responsible for things if you are a worrier. Because it'll, the thing he's trying to bless you with will destroy you. Because you just take all that care on yourself. And that'll put you in the grave, man, before you're supposed to be. And he ain't going to let that happen. He loves you. So then he goes on and he says, um, Behold the fowls of the air. You ever seen them birds? Them birds are pretty. Neither do they reap nor gather into barns, but your heavenly Father feeds them. In other words, excuse me, in Mark 4, he tells his disciples, the whole mystery of the kingdom of heaven is seed time and harvest, sowing and reaping. And, and, and if, you, if you don't understand that, you won't understand anything about the kingdom, how it works, how to work it. And yet he's sitting here saying, now these birds, they don't do the very mystery of the kingdom that I told you about, and yet I still take care of them. In other words, even if you were to flub up sowing and reaping, I'd still find a way to take care of you. Why are you worried about yourself? I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed begging bread. He says, are you not much better than them? Which of you? by taking thought, can add one cupid unto his stature. And why do you take thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. There's some pretty flowers out there, aren't there? How they grow, they don't toil, they don't spin. You know, it says if you don't work, you don't eat. And yet here's these flowers. All they do is just kind of grow. They don't do much of anything but just grow. They're not out harvesting crops and building houses. They're just kind of there. He says, yet I take care of them. And it says, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? And what he's saying is, if you have a poverty mentality, look at how I clothe the fields that are just as likely to burn up tomorrow as they are to be pretty. And I do it over and over year after year. And I, I am so rich and abundant, I invest in things that last but only a minute. Why would I not royally robe you in divine apparel? And that's not just the clothes you wear. That's the house you live in, where you lay your head, the car you drive, the foods you eat, the people you hang with, the smile on your face. That's all clothing. He's like, why would I not give you the best? when I do what I do for the field and for the birds. He says, now watch this. Therefore, so here's little faith. Take no thought saying. So little faith takes a thought and says, what am I going to do? So how, how do you stay in faith about the things of life? Do not take the thought that the enemy or your flesh or your poverty mentality is trying to give it and say it. The minute you take that thought and you say it, now you're in little faith and you're about to mess some stuff up. <laughs> That's not great faith, okay? And so that also tells you how great faith works. Take the word of God and say it. That's really the simplest version of faith right there, is take the word of God that says all things are mine, that pertain to the life of and the godly life he's called me to live, and he teaches me how to get it. And he does it by the anointing that is resident within me, telling me the truth about it at all times. That is great faith, is talking like that, taking those words and saying those words. Notice he says, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, they have no source, they have no covenant. And so they're, they're their own source. They're their own covenant. And God's trying to get you out of a humanistic mindset where you're the source of everything. And he says, but seek first. Your father knows you need all these things. Seek first the kingdom of God. Well, what what was that like some mystical place? Like I walk around with zombie arms trying to touch it somewhere or where or where or might it be? No, in Mark 4, Jesus said, the sower sows the word. The kingdom of God is if a man casts seed into the ground. He says, seek first casting seed into the ground. Go with me over uh, to Mark 4, and let's just, don't take my word for it. Let's look and see what the word says, and it'll make a whole lot more sense to you. 
So in other words, in order to get the all things that he gave you, you're going to have to plant seed. Seed specific to the need that you have. So in Mark 4, verse 13, uh, Jesus says, Know ye therefore not this parable? How then will you know all parables? The sower sows the word. So if you go back to the beginning of the, of the parable, he says, um, verse 2, he taught uh, many things. And in parables, he did this in his doctrine. And he says, there went out a sower to sow. And as he, cast, as he came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And he goes on and he describes four types of soil, which we're going to get to in one of these upcoming broadcasts. But he says, unto you, verse 11, it is given to know the mystery of, of the kingdom of God. This is the mystery of my kingdom. So the word. So when he says, um, seek first the kingdom, he's in line with his parable, which says, so my word first. Well, what does my word say? Well, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, which is I can worry not. I can take no thought saying. I can fret not. I cannot, I, I am, powerful enough in Christ to where I do not have to be self-consumed. I can humble myself and trust that my Father takes care of me, that my Father has the best plan for me. I don't, He does, we'll go with His. I can do that through Christ because Christ did that and the one that's already successfully navigated those waters wants to do it through me and I'm going to let Him. Philippians 4.19, He meets all of my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Does that sound like lack or shortage or, or, or walking around with less than? No. And so you're going to reap what you sow. And if you sow the word, you're going to reap the word. You're going to reap exactly what the word says. The word says he meets all of your need. The sooner you start confessing that, the sooner your needs get met. And in the context of all of that, in addition to the word, he may then say, well, also now I need you to sow uh, this seed of time over here in this location. I need you to sow this seed of talent over here. I need you to sow this seed of treasure over here. And so you start sowing not just the word, but now you start to sow obedience to the word, which is instructing you, teaching you to profit, teaching you to prosper, teaching you to increase by sowing seeds. That's how increase comes through sowing seeds. So I just want to come by today and just share with you a little bit here more about how to profit. How does he teach us to profit? What are some ways that he teaches us to profit that maybe I didn't think about that were hindering my finance and hindering my money? And so he says that seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You have to have a righteousness consciousness. You cannot be constantly dabbling in, oh, my sins, and oh, I'm such a sinner, and oh, I'm so this, and oh, I'm so that. Then just stop all that. You don't have to be. Get born again. Seek first right standing with Christ. And then all these things will be added to you. They're yours by right. They may not be yours by experience. They can be yours by experience and by right by doing what the Word teaches. The first, one of the most important seeds you'll sow today is sowing the seed of that care over on the Lord of how I'm going to prosper and how I'm going to profit. How am I going to get out of this place? Sow the seed of that over on the Lord. I tell you what, there is something about Jesus and his creativity that when you finally do that, you finally break through and give him that, he will blow your mind with unlimited possibilities of how to solve your problems. Where you saw none, you start to see an abundance of solutions because the mind is finally free for that anointing to teach you where you can hear it. There's no clog in the, in the prosperity drain, if you will. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift up my friends to you. I ask you, Father, to continue to give each person listening divine understanding. Help them to see how it all fits together in their life for themselves. I claim this done by faith. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.